Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we get to the end of our series, Illuminating the Mission. We are looking at the mission of Emmanuel Lutheran Church, which is to be connected to Christ, to care for community. We started this whole thing by looking at what it meant to be connected to Christ, what it meant to be saved by His grace, to be forgiven of our sins and promised a life that is eternal. But then connected to Him, we talked about following. We go where He goes, and He takes us along this path this beautiful path where we grow in our faith and, we can, and then we care for others. We saw last week that the first place that care needs to happen is right here, that we need to be a Christ community of mutual care. But as promised, I also said we're going to have to be talking about loving our neighbors, loving the people who are outside of these walls, outside of this community of believers. And of course, what better passage of scripture is there for loving our neighbors than the Good Samaritan? It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. I, I particularly like how it begins, actually. Because there's this, this expert in the law who comes to Jesus with some questions. Obviously, he's trying to trap him. In other translations, it calls him a lawyer. Now, just think about that for a moment. When you've added so many laws to your religion that you need lawyers, that might be a problem. But nonetheless, this is a, a lawyer in the law, in, in the law of Moses. And he comes to Jesus to try and trap him. And so he asks a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Pretty good question. Jesus, of course, very wisely bounces it right back at him. He's like, what do you think? Well, he's thinking on his feet, and he's, he, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Like a good lawyer, he's trying to give the really broad answer, you know, that catch-all answer. He's trying to still get Jesus, right? But, but Jesus doesn't take the bait, and he's like, yep, you're right. Do that. You'll be good. Didn't work. So then, now he's got to work his other angle. So, um, who's my neighbor? And that's where we get to the story of the Good Samaritan. But if you think about it, that's a really good question. Who is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Actually, the answer to that question will largely determine how well we do with all the things we're talking about today. Who is my neighbor? I think it'd be a good thing for us to, uh, to grab a little bit of, a, of agape sticks on this one and, uh, and take, a, take a little look at who our neighbor could be. So here again, the arrow is love, and we see the love of God for us and his design that we would reflect that love back to him and outward to others. It's the other that we're talking about, isn't it? Who is that person, that other person, where, where the arrow is going to be hitting? As far as I can tell, that there's, there's some sort of proximity here. There's some sort of circle of influence. There's some sort of way that we're connected to this person, that we would call them a neighbor. You know, some, in some circles, people say, well, you know, everybody's my neighbor. Well, not really. It's, it's the people that you have some sort of access to, something, some sort of heart for. You know, somebody who's coming into your circle, who, who you can love and who you can care for. You know, for instance, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was going to the seminary, we had, we had some good friends who were our neighbors, quite literally, across the hall from us. He also happened to be the guy who preached at my installation service. And any time... Anytime I'd call him up, it was be, neighbor, neighbor, how you doing? You know, and we'd go and talk seminary stuff, which was fun. Uh, and then uh, they ended up moving up to the Twin Cities. Not quite as close as across the hall, but it was still, neighbor, neighbor, how you doing? Then 
then he decided to go into mission work on the other side of the world. I'd call him up, neighbor, neighbor, how you doing? Even though it was a pretty big pond in between us. But notice, he, he, that, that was a connection I felt with him, right? Another, another example, just a few months ago, I would not have considered the pastors in the bush in Liberia to be my neighbors. I just wouldn't have even thought of them, honestly. But then, a few months ago, they all gathered in one place, and we hung out, and I got to teach them, and they taught me, and it was awesome, and I can't wait to see my neighbors again. My Liberian neighbors. But there was also the atheist who lived just a few blocks from our house. And he dropped by the church every once in a while. I logged hundreds of hours with this man. I, don't, I still don't think he believes my neighbor and he needed someone to talk to so whoever that is right think about whoever that is often they're invisible to us until we open our eyes to see who the neighbor is so there was a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and on the way he fell among robbers they stripped him beat him left him for dead and then along came a priest. And the priest sees the man and has some very important decisions to make. What am I going to do about this man who is on the side of the road who is clinging to life? Unfortunately, this priest decided to love himself instead of loving his neighbor. And I have to ask myself, how does that happen? How does it happen that we come to a place where we don't help the guy on the side of the road? And I can tell you how it happens. We need to tell ourselves a story in order for that to happen. A story about ourselves and a story about that guy in order to justify doing nothing. So, maybe as an example, there are a number of stories this guy could have told himself about this. But here's the story that I think would have happened. So the, the priest is walking down the road, and he sees the guy on the side of the road, and he says to himself, oh boy, boy, what did he do to deserve that? Well, oh, I, better not, I better not get myself in the middle of it. I've got work to do. I've got to get up to Jerusalem, because I, I mean, people depend on me. I've got to do the sacrifices, and people are waiting for me there, and... And if I help this guy, then I'm going to be unclean, and then I can't do my job, and then, and then, um, even, what if he's dead? That's even worse. And, and uh, you know what? If he's not dead already, he'll just die pretty soon, and um, I, I, I'm busy. I got to go. See how quickly we can tell ourselves a story and then justify leaving someone who really does need us? Happens all the time. Unfortunately, it happens so often that we probably don't even realize we're doing it. We justify not helping the person who's right there. And I hate to say this, but some of the worst genocides in history have happened because of the stories we tell ourselves. It happened with Hitler and the Jews. And it happens every day with the unborn who are still in the womb. We tell ourselves stories. And we dehumanize people. And we convince ourselves that either we can't help them or they're not worth helping. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that's everywhere around us. As the story goes on, there's a Levite. And the Levite is kind of a helper to the Jews. He was in the family of, of people who helped, I mean, helped the, uh, the priests. And um, he also would have been somebody who probably should have been there to help. He told himself a story, allowed him to pass by. And then finally, there comes a Samaritan. Now, this Samaritan, it's interesting, we need to note this. Samaritans and Jews truly hated each other. There's a long story that goes into that. Essentially, the Jews thought the Samaritans were half-breeds. They, they didn't want anything to do with them. 
So the Samaritan comes upon this guy, presumably a Jew. And if there's anybody who had a story to tell himself, it's the Samaritan. This guy hates me. I should probably hate him. So I'm going on by, right? Why should I help somebody who hates me? Right? But he didn't. He didn't tell himself that story. Instead, he saw the man as a human being. He saw a man who was suffering. He saw a man made in the image of God, just like him. And it didn't matter if he still hated him. At the end of the day, this man needed help. And so he looked at the things that he had. He looked at the things that God had given him on that trip. And it wasn't much. It was enough to clean his wounds. It was enough for him to bandage up his wounds. And God gave him an animal to put him on. But not much more than that. But that was enough to get him to the inn. That was enough to get him to a place and a, and a person who, where he would be able to, to heal up from his injuries. The Samaritan gave the innkeeper some money and told him he was coming back to check on him on his way home. It's pretty amazing what happens when we allow someone to be a human being. When we see the suffering, when we love our neighbor as ourselves. And I think it's important to note the Samaritan guy couldn't totally care for him. Think about that for a moment. He found him on the side of the road. He did a few, the things that he could do, but he didn't completely change his situation. He actually needed the innkeeper. He needed the innkeeper who would be there to, to care for him, have a bed for him, and, and, and nurse him back to health. Which illustrates a very important principle that you've heard me talk about many times. That is the principle of interdependency. We all need each other. None of us are the superhero. None of us can do it by ourselves. But each of us can play our part. The Samaritan guy on the road played his part. But he couldn't nurse the guy back to health. The innkeeper wasn't on the road. The innkeeper would have never found him. But he could play his part by having a bed and caring for him. And who knows who else went into caring for this man who was robbed on the side of the road. And it makes me think about the church. Here we are, each of us with different gifts and abilities. Each of us blessed by God, first with forgiveness and new life, but then also the inspiration to use our gifts and abilities in mutual love for one another and in love for our neighbor. And I begin to think, what would happen if we as a church were to collectively take these gifts and talents and allow them to bless the people outside of these walls? What would happen? I think we'd start to see that, that people would be loved. People would be cared for in, in ways that none of us individually could do. But we know what it's like. Because we talked about this last week. We're a community of mutual care, right? A Christ community. Where that love is for one another. Think of it like a light. Think of it like a light. We have light to shine into each other's lives. Well, what happens when you get a whole lot of light in one small space? Does that light just stay there in the small space? Of course not. The light's got to shine. So you get a lot of light in one place. All these people who are loving each other and caring for each other, and the light is going to shine. And that's exactly what happens here. Jesus speaks as much right after the Beatitudes. He says that we are the light of the world, and that a city on a hill cannot be hidden, because the light is going to shine out to everyone around them. We are that city on a hill where that mutual love is so strong that it 
just shines out in the world around us and people are blessed. There's a reason why we chose a lighthouse as sort of the, the image for this series. In a lighthouse, there's a very concentrated light with mirrors and, and lenses that focus a beam. And what is that beam there to do? It's to shine out into the storm, into the place where people are scared, into the place where people could perish, you know, our neighbors. And it's there to guide them safely home. We can be that light. Not because of us, but because of what Christ has done for us and through us. Because of the forgiveness of sins through Jesus, through the new life he has given to us, through the mutual care in this community, and a light that shines into the darkness to the people who are scared, to the people who will perish. Without that light, we can shine it. We can guide them home. We can bring them in. They can be connected to Christ. And they can join us in shining that light. Your neighbor is all, your neighbors are all around you. Your neighbors are there to be loved. Let's love them together so that they can be connected to Christ, to care for community. Amen.